Welcome to Stuff You Should Know, a production of iHeartRadio. Hey, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Josh Clark, and there's Charles W. Chuck Bryant, and there's Jerry over there, and this is Stuff You Should Know. I was about to say natural disaster edition, but unnatural disaster edition. Industrial disaster is what they call these. Yeah, human caused. In fact, from what I saw, what we're going to talk about today, the main thing we're talking about today is the largest industrial disaster in United States history still. Oh, still, huh? Yes. What, wow. 70, almost 75 years on. Man, it's sad. This is a big one. Yeah, everything about this was really big, but in basically all the wrong ways. Um, right. We're going to talk today about a disaster called the Texas City Explosion. And sadly, you might say, which one? Because there's been multiple massive explosions in Texas City. And one of the reasons why is because Texas City is has made a name for itself as one of the premier petrochemical ports uh, in the United States and indeed possibly the world. I think it was um, up until World War II, it was like the fourth largest port in Texas. But I think since World War II, um, it's grown even more. And I know for a little while there, BP had a refinery that was its most profitable oil refinery in the world, which is yeah. really saying something. I mean, that's a big deal. BP is an enormous company with multiple refineries. So, you know, for the the biggest one, the most profitable one to be in Texas City, it kind of put Texas City on the map in some circles. Yeah, so Texas City is above the Gulf of Mexico. And like you said, it's a port town Mm -hmm. uh, founded in the late 1800s by some uh, Minnesota hunters. And they said, you know what? I think we can set up shop here. I think we can dig up a canal, set up a rail line. Yeah, Uh, We've got some really good deep water and we could be a good shipping port. I want to know how they, like, what what conversation led to that? Like, what what hunting trip ends up in you basically building a port town in a city that's about as far away from your home as you can get in the same country? Yeah, I mean, there were some real go-getters, I guess. Yeah, I guess so. (laughs) They couldn't just relax uh, and kill animals. Right. (laughs) Oh, God. Uh, So that's what happened to Texas City. I mean, that's how it was kind of founded. And it was a like think refineries, think warehouses and chemical plants. Mm-hmm. Uh, World War II comes around and the military, of course, says, well, we'll be sort of controlling this area for a while because it's a pretty valuable port for us. And we're going to ship munitions in and out of here. Uh, World War II comes and goes. And then after the war, about a year and a half after the war, mm-hmm. it is uh, run by civilians again. And let's just say that it was a little more of a, uh, a relaxed scene than it was when the military was running the show. Yeah, they, the military ran it like a tight ship, basically. Um, and, it, it, yeah, what, it, there's just a big difference between when the military is running a port and when a port's run by just a, a whole bunch of different private companies. You know what I'm saying? Minnesota hunters. Exactly. So um, that's not to say it was just some loosey-goosey um place no. or anything like that but just comparatively speaking uh and one of the uh one of the other things that texas city had going against it on the morning of april 16th 1947 is that there weren't really a lot of standards and regulations for handling chemicals and that we didn't have a, an enormous grasp on just how chemicals worked at that time um and so all of this all of these things kind of came together this kind of slightly lax oversight and just kind of lack much more relaxed attitude toward cargo. And then a lack of awareness about just what kind of dangers different cargoes pose just kind of set things up for to take a bad turn. Yeah, so uh, on the morning of April 16th, there were three uh, ships docked in the port. Um, there was uh, most notably the SS Grand Camp, which was... Uh, it was a it was a military ship at one point, but I think we gave it to France mm-hmm. as like a, hey, sorry, Europe is kind of destroyed. Why don't you take this ship and just use it for whatever you want to do? And it was converted to a cargo ship, yeah. uh, which is which it was on the day of April sixteenth, um, and it was beside the SS High Flyer 
And that was beside uh, the third one named after somebody. What was that one? The Robert Keene or the William yeah. Keene? Oh, well, wait a minute. <laughs> Which one was it? Well, it was um, the Wilson B. Keene, even better. Right. The Billy Keene, as they called it. Yeah, and I believe all three of those were Liberty ships, right? Yeah, well, they were World War II ships. Mm-hmm. And they were, uh, I think the SS High Flyer was being fixed at the time, but was still loaded down with stuff, as was the Grand Camp. And we'll sort of detail what was in the cargo, because it's all very, very key. Yeah, it's really important. So for five days leading up to April 16th, um, <coughs> Steve Doors, I think that's how you say it, but basically dock hands. I don't know why you wouldn't just say dock hands, you know? But the Steve Doors, um, man, I hope I'm saying that correctly, Chuck. <laughs> They had loaded up the Grand Camp with 2,300 tons of ammonium nitrate fertilizer. And uh, these were in 100-pound paper sacks, uh, akin to the kind of sacks that you would buy like Portland cement in these days, right? Yeah. Um, There was some other cargo, sisal twine, (coughs) peanuts. uh, There was some machinery. There was some cotton. There were 16 cases of ammunition, I think, like for small arms ammunition. Um, but for the most part, it was a lot of ammonium nitrate. And the same went for the SS High Flyer, too, which, as you said, was in the next berth. It was loaded with 1,000 tons of ammonium nitrate. And then also, very crucially, 2,000 tons of sulfur. And all of these were also in those same 100-pound paper bags. So at the time, like I was saying, people didn't realize, like, this is— this was a it was a big deal that there was that much ammonium nitrate just sitting around in this port at that time. Yeah, it's a uh, it's a crystal like solid. It's white. Um, a lot of times, it's used for nitrogen for agricultural fertilizer. Mm-hmm. Uh, but if you combine it with fuel oils, it can be very explosive and actually used for that for like mining and construction and stuff like that. But it's not like you know. If you tap the, the side of the bag, it's going to explode. It's pretty safe as long as it's all in the up and up and it's being stored properly. But if it starts to absorb uh, moisture, then it's sort of like Portland cement again. It, it, it's just going to harden to a block. Right. And then if that thing is in a solid block, it's going to be just a little bit more volatile and a little bit more dangerous if ignited. Yeah. And I mean, like, it's not even considered flammable as far as I know. And certainly in 1947, it wasn't considered flammable because if you walked up to some of this this uh, ammonium nitrate, these pellets, and just held a lighter to them, they wouldn't catch fire. That's not mm-hmm. really what they do. What they do is they oxidize things. They basically create free radicals, like we talked about in the free radical episode. Yeah. Um, which sets off like a chain reaction. Um, and because they oxidize, they, they concentrate and condense and produce basically oxygen where it wasn't otherwise present. When, when that, that is combined with the fire, it makes a big time fire. Um, so that's bad enough, right? Like if you set them off, like it'll it'll combust or it'll help something else combust more efficiently and more more um, at a higher temperature. But the problem, the big problem with ammonium nitrate is there is a point where it can reach a high enough heat that it itself decays and degrades. And when that happens, it splits into two gases, nitrous oxide and water vapor, which you're like, well, that's that's great. You know, you just get mm-hmm. super duper high off of one and the other one just makes you a little <laughs> moist. Maybe so. Maybe so. In small enough <clears throat> amounts. But it, when this happens in a large enough amount, especially when this ammonium uh, nitrate is in one big melted block, uh, the chain reaction can happen much more efficiently. And when those gases are, um, are produced when the when the thing decays and separates, um, they expand really quickly, and that produces an explosion. Um, and the the forces the um, the energy that's released from an explosion of ammonium nitrate decaying and converting into nitrous oxide and water vapor is monumental. Like co- compared to atomic bomb blast, basically, if you have enough of it, say twenty three hundred tons and a thousand tons in a couple of ships just sitting in port. All right, that's a great place for a cliffhanger, I think. I think so, too. All right, we'll be right back after this. All 
right. So this stuff, uh, the cargo arrived uh, by train uh, to Texas City, and it was probably already heating up a little bit on this train. Yeah. And maybe already getting to the point where it was a little, un, uh, I don't know about unstable, but volatile at least. And the uh, it gets transferred to the ship. It continues to sort of heat up. And the, the crew and everything, like you said, there wasn't a lot of awareness about kind of anything like this at the time. Mm-hmm. So to them, it was just another uh, cargo hold. They might have said like, you know, be careful with this stuff, guys, or maybe not even that. Yeah. But they, they definitely didn't know like heat bad. For this stuff. Yeah, they said, you owe me two bucks from lunch yesterday. That's what they said <laughs> right. when they were loading this up. <laughs> so around 8 a.m. in the morning, uh, these workers there started noticing that there was smoke and vapors coming out of the ship. Uh, so there was some kind of a fire going on. No one knew how it started or what happened. There are some people anecdotally <laughs> that say it was a cigarette. Uh, which could that have was been. Not in the, could have been. That wasn't in the official report, which also – wouldn't be surprising. Well, what I saw, um, I saw later on, Chuck, that um, the fact that these things were in those paper sacks, that yeah. if they were heating up, they were just going to continue to heat up, being packed tightly in the hold of this unventilated ship. Um, they were just going to get warmer and warmer. And it's possible they that the, the ammonium nitrate caused the paper sack to combust, catch fire, spread to other oh, paper, really? paper sacks. And then you had a, um, a, a positive feedback loop where it just kept getting... Uh, the fire kept getting bigger and bigger and ho- yeah. crucially, very important, hotter and hotter. Right. So <clears> the <throat> captain sees this happening. There are people kind of pouring in and looking around at what's going on. Uh, the captain says, batten down these hatches, f- pull these tarps over them, and start pumping steam in there, which apparently was a, a method at the time to put out a fire on a ship when you didn't want to ruin the cargo, uh, as opposed to just blasting it with a fire hose, which would cause all this stuff to just brick up like Portland cement. Mm-hmm. He starts pumping steam in there, and that just started heating. You know, everyone knows steam is going to heat stuff up. So that just started, and the moisture made a bad situation a lot worse really quickly. Yeah, it, I, I get the impression that had the captain, his name was Captain Charles de Guillabon, um, <laughs> he had he made the decision to just go ahead and let the cargo be ruined and have the fire put out with fire hoses. <clears throat> this all yeah. might never have happened, yeah. but it was. And you, I mean, I understand he, where he was coming from. He didn't want to ruin the cargo if he didn't have to, because steaming out a fire aboard a ship was a, a an accepted firefighting technique. It works, and it it could conceivably sh- save a lot of the cargo. So it's not like he just made this ridiculous, stupid no, uh, no. mistake. It's just in hindsight, it was probably the decision that led to this catastrophe. Yeah, I mean, I think more than anything, it's like you said, it was the time when there was not much regulation and sort of in in the dawning of the chemical age, people just didn't know. Right. And plus also at the time, um, Texas City had a volunteer fire department. Um, which I would guess wouldn't have quite as much dur- jurisdiction and could be told by a captain like, no, 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 just go away. Like, I'm, I'm going to handle this myself rather than being like, uh, no, we're going to put the fire out on, right. your, on your ship. Yeah, that's a good point. <clears throat> so the steam is making things worse. Uh, it pumped into the, the holds and everything's heating up. Everything's getting moist. And like we said, moisture is no good for this stuff. And it did. It started to convert to these solid masses. And, you know, there's going to be gas releasing and it's building up all this pressure because they had battened down the hatches and covered them with tarps. And it so much so that it blew these hatch covers off at about 830 in the morning. That's crazy. Just that alone would have been spectacular. And I'm sure it was. Um, But when those hatches blew off, all, all the smoke that had been kind of stuck in the hole inside the ship started billowing out. And the thing apparently about ammonium nitrate burning is it produces really m- kind of mesmerizing colored smoke from one of the um, witnesses. It was apparently salmon, orange, and purple. Oh, wow. And so the smoke coming out of it um, started to attract <clears throat> people, like like onlookers who were like, what's, what's going on? I want to go see this giant weird fire that's going on down at the port. And something like 300 people, including entire families— Kids from the local school came over. Um, all sorts of people just kind of stopped what they were doing and came to watch this weird fire at the port. And apparently KGBC out of Galveston, which is just 10 miles 
down the coast uh, out in the, the Gulf of Mexico. Um, they were warning people to stay away, but apparently that just alerted more people that there was something right. going on who went down to go check it out themselves. Yeah, so they, they knew that there was a big problem at this point. They did call the firefighters in and a tugboat to maybe try and get that thing out of there. And uh, at this point, like you said, the heat was just so great that even a fire hose isn't going to do much. It's kind of just vaporizing when it hits it. Yeah, that's crazy. Because of the massive amounts of heat. And then, you know, this whole thing started at 8. At 8.30 is when the hatches uh, blew. And then at 9.12, the thing exploded. And we're going to kind of list through a, a pretty horrifying list of um, of impacts from, like, distances. Like, a, a seismograph in Denver, Colorado, picked up this explosion. Yeah. Um, th- and this is, again, in the southernmost part of Texas, right? Yeah, like they felt it in Louisiana, you know, like 3,000-foot firebombs and cargo flying up in the air. So, yeah, the the uh, enormous amount of energy that I was talking about that was released by those 2,300 tons of ammonium nitrate, um, in retrospect, <clears throat> I think has been the – I saw it uh, compared to a 2.7 kiloton blast. Yeah. Which would put this blast – of this ship blowing up at somewhere on the order of about one third, no, I'm sorry, one fifth of the uh, Hiroshima nuclear bomb, which just completely leveled that city. This was about a fifth that size. So it was still a really substantial, enormous blast. And one of the first effects it had is that it blew this Liberty ship, this huge World War II era cargo ship, a couple thousand feet into the air in multiple pieces to just shower out downward as hot metal shrapnel um, onto the surrounding city. And that's not accounting for the shrapnel that immediately blew outward as those gases expand, um, expanded right into all of those onlookers and the people who were fighting the fire around the port. Yeah, there was. Uh, they had a couple of two-ton anchors, one of those went about a mile and a half away in the air. Mm-hmm. Uh, like we said, you could feel it in Louisiana. There was um, a Monsanto and a Union Carbide, uh, two different chemical plants kind of right beside it. They were just flattened, basically just not even there anymore. Yeah, I saw that one of the warehouses, Warehouse Zero at the port, which was, I think, the one that was closest to the ship. Um, this historian from uh, Houston, I think, said that it just disappeared, like it was just gone, like it wasn't there any longer. Like the word disintegrate works in a lot of the instances when you're describing what happened to a lot of the structures and people who were around this this blast. Well, yeah, I mean, that's the obvious thing. You know, there were hundreds of onlookers. There were people that worked there. There were uh, all 28 members of the fire department. They were all killed basically instantly. Anyone within that zone was killed instantly. Some people, like you said, just just not even able to recover enough body parts to identify humans at that point. Yeah, that proved to be a real problem. So, like, um, first of all, the fact that the entire fire department, <clears throat> apparently one, there was one survivor from the fire department, but he was out of town at the time. That's why he survived. Yeah. But the whole fire department and all of their equipment was immediately wiped out. Um, one of the problems was with an explosion like this in a place like this is that it ruptures lines and pipes and all of those petrochemicals that are being refined suddenly catch fire. So now you have these out of control fires in the buildings and structures that are left standing um, and you no longer have a fire department or any fire equipment to put it out for a little while. So the the um, immediate impact out, outside of the blast was also the the fires that were um, lit r- just right after this, too. Well, I mean, you've got, you know, you've got the metal shrapnel, but then you've also, remember, there were peanuts and twine and cotton mm-hmm. and all this stuff. So that's, these are like fireballs being launched, basically starting fires all over the place. It wasn't just in the immediate area. And like you said, because the fire department was then out of commission, that's that's real trouble. Yeah, so it took a little while for um, more aid to show up, but apparently... This, this explosion was so bad and the catastrophe was so great. The Army, Navy, Coast Guard, Marines, Texas National Guard, and then firefighters from surrounding uh, cities all came out to help. Man. And this wasn't just like putting this chemical fire out, but also like trying to, you know, rescue people from rubble. Like there's really a lot that we could sit here and say, but 
if you have a computer in front of you, like, just look up pictures um, from the Texas City explosion of 1947. It, yeah. It's just unreal <clears throat> what happened to, like, enormous steel buildings just turned into, like, twisted metal. And this is, like, you know, the middle of a work day. So there were people trapped all over the place um, in this debris. So there was a huge um, uh, rescue operation that had to start. But it was delayed because most of the people who were tasked with that kind of thing had all been killed in the initial blast. Yeah, so remember earlier we said that there were three ships there. Uh, this one blows up, and obviously, you know, it, it's a it's a full-on, like, 9-11 scene at this point with just how chaotic it is. Mm -hmm. People are uh, not noticing that right next door, the SS High Flyer, also, remember, was loaded with this stuff and also with sulfur, which makes it become unstable. And this thing had been unlodged. I mean, I'm surprised it's just the integrity of these ships is the only reason that those weren't just blown to bits, too. Yeah. Like, it was kind of right next to it and, it, and it was still intact, at least. And it was blown from its moorings, though, and drifted over and kind of uh, attached itself to the Wilson B. Keene, which was, again, in the slip next to it. And I think there were some crew members aboard in there that I guess were just protected by that thick steel, right? Yeah, from what I understand. Um, and they were kind of still doing their thing. For a little while, and they were finally, because the, the uh, high flyer caught fire as well, um, they were finally forced out by the smoke because this is some noxious, noxious smoke. This isn't, I mean, this isn't just like wood-burning smoke. This is some really bad chemical smoke that can mess you up. It's crazy that these sailors stayed aboard for an hour. But they're finally forced off a ship. But they tell people like, hey, this is this is on fire. And everybody's like, uh, have you seen the other problems we have over here? And the right. fire department just got basically vaporized. Um, so the fire was allowed to continue on the high flyer for hours, hours and hours. Like the, that blast happened at 9, 12 a.m. And it wasn't until the afternoon that somebody else rediscovered the fire aboard the high flyer and started to kind of like raise the alarm about this. Um, still, this is such a chaotic scene that there wasn't anything immediately done about it. And it wasn't until 11 p.m. that they're finally like, oh, this is a really... This is a bad jam because not only do we have a thousand tons, tons of ammonium nitrate aboard the high flyer, there's that <clears> sulfur <throat> you mentioned, Chuck. And like you said, it makes it even more unstable in that, you know how um, ni uh, ammonium nitrate oxidizes things? Yeah. Sulfur is like food to that stuff. As far, it oxidizes sulfur. It's just like piling on this oxidizing fuel to make the blast even more energetic. So it would it would be a really big problem if the high flyer blew up. So they brought in some tugboats and a fireboat, I think, from Galveston and started to try to take it out of the berth um, to tug it out to sea to let it, like, burn out or blow up or whatever it was going to do. But I guess it was stuck so fast that um, that they couldn't get it out. Yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, this thing was not... I guess just sort of wedged in there from that first explosion. And I think they worked on it for a couple of hours. They started at about 11 PM. Mm -hmm. And then it looks like by 1 AM, they had stopped that uh, process. And at 1:10, uh, and this is now on April 17th, you know, early the next morning, uh, the high flyer exploded as well. And this was even more violent. Um, the only I mean, it's not a saving grace at all because everything was already leveled. But the only reason it didn't cause more death and more destruction, <clears throat> sadly, is because everything was already destroyed and most people were already dead. Yeah, and plus also they knew enough by this time that they needed to clear the area, that there wasn't anything they could do. So everybody who was working in the rescue operation was told to leave. So there, I, just, I don't know if there were any more deaths from the high flyer blowing up, but the problem was is that any fires that might have been put out were relit, and other structures that may have been spared from the initial blast were now leveled or caught fire or both. So it was a big problem that the high flyer blew up as well. Uh, I think it sunk the the Wilson Keene too. It didn't did. It? it sunk it, um, and it was uh, it was it, yeah. I can only imagine too. Also, if you survive that first one, to have another blast like that, even one yeah. you were away from and you knew was coming, 
would just do something to the nerves that would be really difficult to recover from. Yeah, for sure. You want to take a break? Yeah, we'll take a little break and we'll talk about sort of the results of the devastation and a couple of other incidents right after this. Okay, so Chuck, um, one thing that we didn't say was that uh, the the initial explosion by the Grand Camp created like a 15-foot tidal wave <clears throat> that washed inland. And um, people died almost in creative ways in this disaster. And one of those ways was um, uh, those petrochemicals. I think there was a molasses refinery that started to get mixed in that kept the petrochemicals burning in the water uh, when it mixed with them. When this tidal wave blew out, um, when it blew in, I'm sorry, it was on fire. So it it actually caught people on fire. It uh, it caught people on fire on the way back out to sea. And people who'd survived the initial blast were actually swept out and drowned from this too. There were people who died in airplanes that had come around to kind of circle the area um, and were blown out of the sky. Um, there were people who died in buildings that collapsed. There were people who died from shrapnel falling out of the sky and killing them, even though they were miles away. Like there were, there was so much death and destruction that it's really difficult to get across what happened to this poor little port city that hadn't done anything to anybody that just suddenly blew up. Yeah. In the end, uh, the official death toll was, uh, close to 600, 581 people, uh, 113 of which were just vaporized. No trace was ever found of 113 people. Mm-hmm. Uh, casualties up to 5,000. The numbers kind of vary, but anywhere from 3,500 to 5,000. And, you know, Texas City was uh, not a very big place. It was about 16,000 strong. Right. So this was just devastating to the city. Uh, into the region. Um, it took about a week to put out all these fires and I think a full month plus to recover uh, whatever bodies they could recover at that point. Yeah, the final body wasn't found until mid-May. Um, the There was uh, there were people who were never, um, like you said, accounted for. There were There were, the converse of that was true too. There were parts of people that were never, identified. Yeah. Um, and one of the accounts that I read was, like I was saying, was written by, a, a I think, a University of Houston historian um, named Cheryl uh, Lowersdorf Ross in um, the in the journal <clears throat> Houston History. But she recounts somebody um, mentioning a woman who was trying to identify her husband who was lost in the disaster, and she had to sort through hands. They had a collection mm. of hands that um, this woman wow. was trying to figure out which one belonged to her husband. And, like, that's just nuts to hear. But if you can even begin to put yourself into that woman's shoes. Yeah, the reality of that. Yes, of being in that room of, like, looking at different hands. And then also, not just the horror of, of that, of, of, like, having to look through body parts that may or may not be your husband's. But then the self-doubt, like, is that my husband's hand? Like, I— I don't remember what it looked like, you know, like that, just your mind messing with you on top of the horrific experience that you're already um, undergoing. But she was one of many because something like 61 um, people, I believe, were interred without being identified, but their their remains were um, kind of assembled and uh, and and put together in a memorial service that was attended by something like thousands of people, I believe. So, Chuck, so if there was 16,000 people and that many people were hurt or killed by this blast, you can imagine how quickly this little town was overwhelmed with all these casualties. And so they were getting people like every which way, trucking them over to Gal- Galveston, like getting them wherever they could, whatever hospital they could find. But very quickly, the high school gym was taken over to serve as a field hospital. And then shortly after that, the morgue. 
And one of the stories that stuck out to me was the Boy Scouts were pressed into service to basically help out however they could. And these poor little, like, like teenage and preteen scouts are, like, working in this makeshift morgue in their high school gym. Like, imagine the impression that had on them the rest of their life, you know? Jeez. I know. Isn't that crazy? Like, every aspect of this story is just nuts. It's very sad. Yeah, and of course, the, the financial loss was huge. Um, about $100 million in property loss, $500 million in uh, lost petroleum products, and that's about $700 million and $3.5 billion in today dollars. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think there is um, sort of buried beneath the berms there as, as a memorial park where 63 unidentified victims are buried. Yeah, that's what I was talking uh, about. Yeah, and there's that anchor that we talked about. I don't know if it was the one that actually blew the mile and a half away, but at least one of the anchors is uh, is a monument at the park along with um, a scarred propeller from the High Flyer at the entrance to the port there at Texas City. Yeah, so that, um, that funeral procession that they had that attracted, I think, something like 5,000 mourners um, was a real, like, community effort. Um, there were something like 50-plus funeral homes from 28 different cities that all participated. And each of these 63 unidentified people, uh, or their remains, I should say, were put in their own individual caskets and buried in the Memorial Park, which is still, you know, there. That that park is still there with the anchor and everything. Um, but it was, it, it's just, it's such a, an enormous, weird catastrophe and just such a devastating thing, especially looking back 70 years to read about. But when you do read about it, if you can just kind of put yourself in mind of what that was like, of you know, trying to uh, recover from that, it's, it's astounding that Texas City did recover. A lot of people moved um, and just said, not only like, do I think the city's never going to come back from this? I don't know if I can come back from this. But the yeah, city actually did come back and they did build back from what I understand, even bigger than before, which is how that BP refinery that ended up blowing up that became the most profitable in BP's entire company um, because the city built back even better than before. That's great. It is great. I mean, not great that it it exploded again in 2005, obviously, but great that they were had the stick-to-itness to come back as a city. So, you know, obviously following something like this, there's going to be a lot more regulation going on. Uh, The U.S. is going to step up federally and say, hey, wait a minute, we really need to take a look at how we're handling these chemicals, how we're storing these things, how we're shipping these things. Uh, And a lot of changes were made here and around the world. But uh, it's not to say that that completely prevented this from happening again, because in uh, Beirut just last year, in August of 2020, there was another big cargo of ammonium nitrate that had been sitting in a warehouse for seven years. It's no one is exactly sure why it ignited this time, but there was a dock worker that said that there were fireworks stored nearby, and they did find thousands of kilograms of fireworks uh, recovered from a warehouse at that port. And this explosion was, you know, it was a crater about 460 feet wide, Mm -hmm. and, you know, it was about as big as the Texas City blast. I so I saw both. I saw that it was about as big, and I saw that it was about half the size. But I mean, but even at half, you know, but so yeah, go look at video of that. What's astounding about that Beirut blast is there happens to be people who are filming when it happened because there was a fire. Oh, I remember when it happened, yeah. So you've seen that, that like that white cloud that's that water vapor expanding, right? And the, 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 you can't see it, but there's nitrous oxide gas in there as well. Um, So imagine twice that size. That's that would probably be about the size of that first Texas City blast in 1947. Yeah, I mean, I, I remember seeing it on the news, and uh, I don't remember if they mentioned Texas City, but um, yeah, I mean, this is stuff that was just stored down there for like seven years, soaking up that that warm kind of moist Mediterranean breeze. Right. Uh, not the way you should handle and store this stuff. No, and like the story behind it is kind of interesting. Like the, the it was started in Georgia, not our Georgia, but the Republic of Georgia, 
um, on way on route to Mozambique, and the apparently the owners were like, "We're not making enough money on this this trip, so we're gonna divert over to um, Beirut and pick up some more freight." And the crew said, "No, we're not gonna do that. It's gonna make the weight dangerous." So they balked. Port fees started racking up, and the owners apparently just decided to abandon the crew, the ship, and the cargo. The cargo, once it was impounded, should have been sold off, but it wasn't. Instead, it just like you said, sat there, stored incorrectly for six years until something caused it to blow up, which is, I mean, just the the idea that it was just negligence that led to that catastrophe is, it's even worse. I, th- I think that's something that's missing from the Texas City disaster. There, there wasn't really any negligent act, maybe a mistake or a bad choice, but no one was particularly negligent about it. So I think that's, it kind of makes the Beirut blast even worse, that people were supposed to be doing stuff that they didn't do, and a lot of people died as a result. Yeah, I think the BP refinery in 2005, they had to pay out about 50 million bucks for that one mm-hmm. after they did a, uh, a a little safety audit. And in that safety audit, um, they found – and this was before the blast, actually. They did a safety audit, and they found that a lot of people that worked at this plant, um, it says, came to work with, quote, an exceptional degree of fear of catastrophic incidences. Yeah. Uh, incidents, end quote. I- That's a little bit of a – Ocean nightmare. Everything that I've read about that was that that was a direct result of BP cutting safety in favor of higher profit margins. That that's what happened. That's what allowed this plant to deteriorate and the machinery just didn't work. But they traced this explosion. This is an oil refinery explosion. It had nothing to do with ammonium nitrate. But the um, the I think whatever whatever chemical they put in gas to boost the octane level. They turned a machine on that does that, and somehow, like, all these components to the to gasoline started vaporizing out into the air. It started shooting out of this tower because the pressure was overloaded. And there was so much gas vapor in the air that somebody had a pickup truck running nearby, <clears throat> and it got sucked up into the air intake, and the engine started revving, and that's actually what ignited the whole thing, all of this gas vapor, this pickup truck sucking in gas molecules that were just vaporized in the air around it. Crazy. In Texas City, again. It's crazy. So, uh, you got anything else? I got nothing else. Well, if you want to know more about the Texas City disaster, uh, you can go look that up. Um, I would strongly recommend reading um, Cheryl uh, Lowersdorf Ross's Changing Lives in a Heartbeat journal article. And also, big shout out to fireengineering.com. They had a good one. And then the local 1259, the Texas City Firefighters Union, um, has a really comprehensive overview of the Texas City disaster, too. So maybe check those out for even more details. Uh, and since, totally. since I said that, it's time for listener mail. Yeah, I'm going to call this, uh, well, I'm going to call it what Ryan called it. Well, I'm dumb, but I'm over it. Hey, guys, long time, first time. Uh, I thought I'd tell you, you had me duped for a long time when I first started listening to the show a few years ago. And probably for a year after that first episode, I honestly thought there was a list of key words that Josh referred to toward the end of the episode whenever he says, well, since I said blank, it's time for listener mail. (laughs) For an (laughs) embarrassing... This is very cute. For an embarrassingly long time, I really thought that the blank word was from a predetermined master list (laughs) and that you had revealed that list of words to the audience in an early episode. Wow. I guess like the magic word in, uh, Pee Wee's Playhouse. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Was that what it was? Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) This guy must have really loved Pee Wee's Playhouse. I started listening to increasingly older episodes in hopes that I would hear that list or catch a trend toward the words used. Yeah. Josh's transition with that statement at the end of every episode is just so smooth. Hey, there you go. Thanks, man. It wasn't until one episode when Josh's word was so mundane, so common, it was probably the or if or something along those lines, that I finally realized there is no list. I had been fooled. The scales just fell from his eyes and he was free (laughs) finally. Well, since you said scales, (laughs) uh, those random words are just that, random. I actually felt a bit disappointed when I realized this, but it actually took some of the mystery out of the show. But I'm over it now. Uh, whether or not it's good to admit I'd been fooled by this for a long time is up for debate, but I've been meaning to tell you about this for a while. Hope you think of me every time Josh transitions to listener mail from now on. I totally will. Yeah. Uh, take care and keep doing what you're doing because it's a fantastic show. And since I said show, 
dot, dot, dot. Mm -hmm. What? That's great. That is from uh, Ryan Peschel. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks for getting in our heads like that. Apparently, we got in your heads, too, so it's only fair. Don't you think, Chuck? Yeah, and just right then, I didn't think we had a listener mail, and then look what pops up. Ryan Peschel saves the day again, and only Ryan knows what I'm talking about. (laughs) I just ruined his life again. He's back in the game. Uh, If you want to get in touch with us and try to get in our heads like Ryan did, so we have to think of you every time we say something about listener mail or what have you, you can write to us. Send us an email to stuffpodcast at iheartradio.com. Stuff You Should Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.